In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Amen. In the beginning. What better way to begin the new year than with hearing the prologue of John's Gospel? As we start a new calendar year, full of our wondering, anticipation, and probably following the last two years with a dollop of anxiety for good measure, we are reminded, as Brendan Byrne writes, that everything Jesus will say and do in his human life, he will do as the one sent into the world by the Father on a divine errand of love. I think that's a beautiful phrase, a divine errand of love, describing the action of God in the world through the incarnation made known to us in the flesh in Jesus. Love and light, the other great image of John's gospel, which we hear today, become mutually symbolic where there is light, there is also love, and vice versa. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. We know this verse so well. It's one of my favorite verses of scripture. A powerful image brought visually to life and light for us at the Easter Vigil, the lighting of the Paschal candle from a fire kindled in the darkness, a visual sign that the darkness has not triumphed, has not overcome the light and love of God. But we're not at Easter yet. This is just the beginning or a beginning. For John's Gospeler talks about a beginning which was before time and out of which things came into being through divine action. And what comes into being was light. In Genesis 1, as we hear reflected in the prologue in the Gospel today, light, love, life, come into being, a veritable contrast to the darkness around it. Out of the darkness, light is brought. And that's the thing which has taken me far too long to understand fully. The darkness doesn't overcome the light, the darkness is not greater than the light. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is still there. Brendan Byrne states that the light has not banished the darkness, and because as humans we are free, free to choose, the choice between choosing light and God's love, or rejecting God's love, and choosing darkness, is always before us. As Byrne writes, only as free beings can we enter into the personal relationship with God that God wants, a relationship of love that would be an extension into the world of the divine communion of love between Father and Son. But in creating us free, God took the risk that human beings would respond with rejection rather than love. As I've reflected on the events of the past two weeks concerning escalating COVID-19 infections, as we've seen first in our Novocastrian community and then throughout the state, a reflection of the wider world situation, it has at times felt as if there were a pressing darkness. 
It has seemed to me that certain decisions, or rather lack of decisions, have shown a lack of love for not only the vulnerable, but for the community at large. Almost two years of proactive measures to educate, to manage risk, to care for one another, to love one another, seems to me to be tossed out in a flurry of redefinitions, fewer testing opportunities, indeed an active discouragement to be tested, and a blame game which pins the COVID tale as far away from the much vaunted personal responsibility as possible by making it not only someone else's problem, but someone else's fault as well. For me, this is not love in action. And the word became flesh and lived among us. This is the incarnation, God fully human, fully divine, as I quoted Brendan Byrne earlier, a divine errand of love. What does it mean for us then to cheapen human life if it is in humanity that God chose to dwell? What does it mean for us then to adopt a posture towards each other which determines that the child of God beside me in the supermarket, sitting next to me on the train, waiting for a coffee, or an overwhelmed pharmacist trying to administer boosters is less worthy of my love through my actions or inactions. Why would I choose to reject love and light and life? Why is darkness chosen over light? Carolyn Lewis of Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota argues that often our theology, our understanding of the incarnation boils down to, did Jesus die for this? Rather, Lewis argues it's more helpful to ask the question, did Jesus live for this? Lewis writes, if we believe in the incarnation, then did Jesus have to live for this might also preface what we do as a church because a myopic view of the incarnation that focuses only on Jesus' death becomes an excuse for all kinds of mediocrities and atrocities, atrocities. It becomes ultimately a truncated theology. If we ask ourselves the question, did Jesus live for this? If we allow that question, our understanding of the incarnation of God with us, Emmanuel, if we allow that to inform our decisions, then I believe we choose to align ourselves with God's errand of love in the world. We choose light and love and life. As we stand two days into this new year, the challenge for us individually and as a community is how we will encourage nurture, foster, enable, choosing light over darkness. Not just once, and not just this time or for this particular cause, but over and over again. Each time we are faced with the decision, we are asked, do we choose light or prefer darkness? We are asked to choose light over and over again because God loves over and over again infinitely without measure. Choosing light, love, life takes strength and courage, resilience and perseverance and often may seem countercultural to the perceived messages that are made dominant. And in that situation, where it can all feel frustrating, 
There's a temptation for us to throw our hands up in the air and cry with resignation, why bother if no one else is bothering? Because God bothered. God bothered about us. Bothered to be born for us in Jesus. Incarnation. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Amen.